his audience, his plays often shocked audience because of their subject matter, because he insisted on truthfully depicting their vices and their follies. He had a great deal of respect and patronage from enlightened theater goers and remains, as you well know, one of the most popular playwrights of all time. His dialogue consists of rhymed couplets, and while there are several uh, prose versions of his plays, certainly those by Richard Wilbur, which are translated couplets, are by far the best. He features misers, misanthropes, hypochondriac, and he had a keen eye for human foibles, and his notion of farce and his ability to write farce is still very admired today. He had a number of characters that was deeply influenced by the Commedia dell'arte. Uh, in The Miser, Harpagon is an avarice, uh, is a, uh, an old man reminiscent of Pantalone. He courts a young woman. Uh, he has young lovers. His plots are contrived and adhere to neoclassic rules and are frequently resolved with a deus ex machina. Perhaps uh, Tartuffe is the greatest example because in Tartuffe, Tartuffe steals the box of documents, sends it away to the king. Tartuffe thinks he's ruined, thinks that these seditious documents will come back to haunt him. And in the end, an emissary from the king arrives and said, oh, the king is all-knowing and knows that you, Monsieur Organ, are not a spy and are not a traitor and hands him back the box of papers. In fact, some scholars will argue that the reason that ending is there is that earlier versions of the play did not praise the king enough, and Moliere wanted to have it produced, so he praised the king and his wisdom at the end to make it work. So those are really the three big playwrights of the era. Now, this is the last section that we're going to discuss, and what is the connection between the French Renaissance in subsequent eras of theater history. Well, first and foremost, the French models of neoclassicism, as well as their models for comedy and tragedy, dominated the European theater scene for many years. Even the British, in 1660, used some neoclassic principles. Secondly, the work of Moliere is extremely popular and his characters continue to play well today. So it influenced subsequent generations of comedians. The classical plays provide society with an image of continuity and a sense of location in history. The plays tell us about life of the time. We get a view of the social, the economic, and the relationships between the crown and other people. So, all of that information is available to you in the theater and the literature of the French Renaissance. Um, most of the information I provided you is from a history text by Wilson and Goldfarb on the playwrights, if you wish to do that, and I certainly want to attribute that uh, and not just read it to you. I have a couple of anecdotes that I would like to read to you to kind of conclude this, and I'm sorry I'm not there to uh, share this with you. Playwriting was not considered by some to be a noble profession, and Moliere was a frequent visitor to the court of Louis XIV. One day, he came into the royal bedroom and, was find, and found a chamberlain there making up the royal bed. Moliere offered to help the chamberlain make the bed. What? asked the chamberlain that I would share my work with a lowly comedian? Never! Another chamberlain overheard the conversation. He was a cultivated man and a bit of a poet himself. And seeing the dramatist stand there, wounded in his pride, he went up to him quickly and said, Monsieur Moliere, would you please do me the great honor of making up the king's bed with me? So some people looked down on him. Uh, Shakespeare died a peaceful death. Yet his tomb contained strict instructions not to disturb his bones, as if he saw the uh, controversies regarding the authorship of his plays. Moliere was supposed to have died, rumor has it and legend has it, while giving a performance in the title role of the premiere of his play, The Imaginary Invalid. However, history tells us that he actually passed away a few hours after the fourth performance, but he did die in performance. Although he was the most famous actor in France, and he was a favorite of Louis XIV, 
the church refused him a Christian burial because he did not repent of being an actor before giving up his soul. In other words, if you were an actor, you had to repent of that sin before you could be sent to heaven. Louis XIV was said, was told that the Archbishop of Paris would not bury Moliere in consecrated ground. He pleaded with the Archbishop, but the Archbishop wasn't moving. So finally, Louis XIV asked this question of the Archbishop. How many feet down does consecrated ground reach? Hmm. The Archbishop replied, eight feet. So Louis, in order to bury Moliere in the Catholic cemetery, buried Moliere deeper than eight feet so that he could be buried in the cemetery. But he wasn't buried in consecrated ground because consecrated ground only went down eight feet. It said Moliere read his comedies to one of his female servants. And when he uh, perceived that the passages which he intended to be laughable and humorous had no effect, he changed them or threw them away. He also required that he, the children of his performers would bring their children to rehearsals of their plays and watch them, and so that he could learn something from their understanding and their expression of emotion. Finally, one last story about Moliere, and I think I told you this one. Um, Moliere was preparing to stage Corneille's Titus and Bernice, and Michel Baron, the famous actor, was not, uh, was playing the role, the lead role, and he couldn't figure out the meaning of certain words. And Baron went to Corneille, the playwright, and the poet read a few lines and said, I don't know what they mean either. And so uh, the actor said, well, what should I do? I don't know what the lines mean. I don't know how to say them. And Corneille said, say nothing. Just say, say the words, and somebody in the audience will admire their beauty no matter what you do. So that you can see this was a time where the arts, and particularly the theater, was celebrated as a sign of wealth. It was celebrated as a time of uh, opulence. It was celebrated as something for the uh, rich and the elite to participate. Louis poured a lot of money into the arts until they began, and uh, the treasury began to get sapped by war and other issues. It produced a number of noted playwrights and a great deal of literature, as well as wonderful scenery and some developments in the artistic front. The French Renaissance had deep influence on later generations and continues to influence us today, which one of you doesn't like a Moliere play? So, please take the notes on this. Please enjoy this little video presentation. And I will see you on Monday, the 24th, when we reconvene for class. Have a good weekend. Bye now, you hear?